So James um, chapter 5, verse 12 is sharing something important, and I believe that James makes that very clear as we look at the first words here in James chapter 5, verse 12. Notice what it says, but above all, my brethren. So in other words, he's speaking to believers, and after having shared the truths, the very practical truths that we've read in James chapter 1 through 4 and the first part of chapter 5, now he says, uh, but above all, my brethren, as if to say this is something that's really important, something that you need to treasure. Now, we treat important things different than other things, and we should. And we have a tendency of keeping or collecting those things that are important. Of course, people collect all sorts of different things. If you were to Google it, there's actually the top 10 things that people collect. Antiques are number one. Coins, stamps, trading cards, dolls, toys, wine, comic books, vinyl records, because we all know it sounds better on vinyl. Classic cars and fine art. Those are the top 10 things that people collect. It got me thinking about the things that, that I collect, and the things that I collect are things that really are attached to people. So in other words, um, pictures, cards, notes, those are things that I collect. In fact, I have a, a treasure chest, a, a box in my office upstairs, and it holds every single note, every single card that's ever been written to me. I cherish those things. In fact, I go through them sometimes and I read them because they're that important. And the reason why they're important is because each one of those is attached to a person and speaks to me about a relationship. Listen, the same is true when it comes to the word of God. We need to keep his word. Notice what the Bible says in Job 23 verse 12, as Job is speaking and he says, I have treasured the words of his mouth. In other words, I have treasured God's word more than my necessary food. And so he's treasured the word of God. It's important to understand this, that as we read the word of God, we understand that we have a God in heaven who treasures things about us. In fact, there are two things that the Bible says God collects. Turn over to Psalm 56, Psalm 56, and we'll see here the first thing that God collects. Psalm 56, looking at verse eight. I'm gonna read it to you in the NLT because of the way that it's written, but Psalm 56, verse eight, means the same thing in the New King James if you're reading it there. It says this, you keep track of all my sorrows, you have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. The idea is this. Every single time you have cried, every tear that you shed, God saw it. God understood it. And notice what it says. He recorded each one in his book. Meaning this. It's not just the tear. It's not just the pain. But it's the reason why. God knows the reason why you were hurt. God knows what happened. Listen, God knows what he did through the hurt or what he wants to do through that hurt in the future for you. He records the whole thing. And so he treasures that. Not because, you know, the pain that we have is good, but because he'll use that pain. He'll use that suffering for good in our lives. And so he treasures those things. He collects them. He keeps them. Revelation 5 verse 8 says this, Now when he, that is God, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Meaning this, God collects our tears, but he also collects our prayers. And oftentimes our prayers are related to our tears or related to our hurts. And so God collects those things. He treasures them. He keeps them. But the idea of keeping something goes beyond just collecting. The word for keeping, both in Old and New Testament, basically means the same thing. It means to guard or to keep in view. In other words, to keep in mind that you're thoughtful about the thing because it's important. You treasure it, but you also guard it. You protect it. You don't want to lose it. And in the New Testament, you maintain it. In other words, it's something that's, that's nurtured. And so there are things that we should keep. In fact, there are three 
in James chapter 5, verse 12, there are three precious things worth keeping. The first is this, keep your word. The second is keep your heart. And the third is keep your reward. So notice verse 12, it says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. So number one, keep your word. Turn over to 1 John chapter two, please. Take a look at 1 John chapter two. We're gonna look at verse four. So 1 John chapter two, verse four. Notice what it says here. It says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in other words, whoever keeps God's word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So again, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Notice again, 1 John 2, 4, but whoever keeps his word, whoever keeps God's word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. In other words, we're mature. We've, we've come to full growth. And so that's what we need to see happen in our lives. The idea is this, if we keep God's word, then we'll learn to keep our word. Because the Bible has a lot to say about speaking in such a way that demonstrates integrity. We're called to speak the truth. We're called to put perverse lips far away from us. We're called not to be deceitful in any way. In other words, we're we're not to to refrain from speaking the information that needs to be shared. We're we're not supposed to be tail bearers. We're not supposed to have loose speech. We're not supposed to speak in a way that's corrupt or poisoned, but we're supposed to speak words that are edifying, that which profits the hearer. Our words are supposed to be seasoned with grace. In other words, that grace is all around our conversation. Okay? If we know God's word, if we embrace God's word, if we keep his word, then we naturally are going to keep our word as well. Meaning this, when we say we're going to do something, we're going to do it. When we say something is true, it's going to be true. We're going to put lying lips far from us. So again, it's a precious thing worth keeping. Keep your word. In other words, guard it. Guard your words. Guard your speech. Protect your speech. Keep an eye on it. Keep an open ear to make sure that the words that you're speaking are, in fact, true words. Now, take a look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Notice what Jesus says here in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, we're looking here at verse 33 and following. Because what James is saying here in James chapter 5 is actually quoting what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. So notice Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Jesus here is speaking and he says this, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. In other words, if your word isn't enough, then what's gonna happen really is evil that comes out of your mouth. And so just keep your word, okay? Now, what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, 33, again, parrots what James is saying here in James chapter 5, verse 12. But do not swear is not speaking about profanity. So when we hear the word swear, we have a tendency of thinking profanity or we think of cursing. But it's not cursing like the idea of, 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 of a, a curse word or speaking in a way that's corrupt or polluted. The idea of the swearing is to make an oath. But he's not saying that making an oath is wrong. He's saying making an oath that is frivolous, making an oath that you don't mean, making an oath that doesn't have a purpose, having a vain oath, that's what's wrong. In other words, the Bible speaks about oath making in many different ways, in positive ways, Abraham is described as making oaths twice. Isaac makes an oath once. Elijah makes an oath. Paul makes two oaths. And God makes an oath in Psalm 15 and also in Hebrews 6. 
Jesus and James are not saying that it's wrong for you or I to make an oath. For example, marriage vows, that's an oath and there's nothing wrong with it. Or if you join the military or if you become a police officer or a firefighter, you're going to take an oath. There's nothing wrong with that. If you got elected president of the United States, you'd have an inauguration day. It could happen, right? It'd be okay for you to take an oath. Or if you're a witness in a, a court of law and you put your hand on the Bible and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. There's nothing wrong with those types of oaths. All of those oaths have a purpose and all of those oaths are intended to be sincere. What it's talking about is the practice of making oaths that was common in, in Jewish history and began to infect the early church. They would say things like this, by my life, I'm telling you the truth. And then they would say whatever it was. Or by my head, I'm telling you the truth. Or they would bring out the big guns and say, by heaven, I'm telling you the truth. Or by the name of God, I'm telling you the truth. What Jesus is saying and what James is saying is, just tell the truth. You don't have to make all these oaths as if somehow that gives you credibility. The thing we need to remember is this. Credibility is a result of integrity. Again, credibility is a result of integrity. Just keep your word. You see, when we're kids and we're growing up, going to school and we're on the playground, there are times when someone might say something. And let's say, for example, one person tells another person that they like so-and-so. But then they tell the person they told, but don't tell so-and-so. And the person says, I won't. But then the person does. Because the person later says, well, I had my fingers crossed behind my back. Okay? That's what Jesus is speaking against. That's what they would do. They would make these O's, but it was really superstition, and they had what were called non-binding oaths. Because in essence, what they were saying is, my fingers were crossed. Instead, what Jesus is saying and what James is saying is, keep your word. In other words, we should grow out of that type of immaturity. We should grow out of lying. So first of all, that precious thing worth keeping, keep your word. Number two, keep your heart. Okay, Keep your heart. Notice it goes on to say, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. Would you turn your Bibles with me to Proverbs, please? We're going to take a look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, and we're looking here at verse 23. So Proverbs 4, verse 23. Now, Proverbs, of course, is a book that is filled with wisdom. It was written by the wisest person who ever lived. And notice the encouragement, also the exhortation, that is given to each one of us here in Proverbs 4, verse 23. It says this, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now remember, the word for keep means to guard or to protect, to keep your eye on, in other words, to be aware, to be cognizant always. And so keep your heart, maintain your heart, with all diligence, pay attention to it. For out of it spring the issues of life. So in other words, what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. So keep your heart. With all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Verse 24, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. See the relationship? We learn to keep our word. Then of course, it will lead into us learning how to keep our heart. And so Keep your heart with all diligence, understanding this, that if we have a problem with our speech, it's a deeper problem, meaning we have a problem with our heart. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the conscience fund the IRS has? Has anybody ever heard of that? We had one person for a service who'd heard of it. It's, it's real, it exists, but it's called the conscience fund. It was created by the IRS in 1950, for people who feel bad for cheating on their taxes. 
and want to make it right, this fund um, receives money anonymously. The idea is this, that you can feel better because you cheated by giving the money you owe without being afraid of getting audited for your present tax returns, right? And so this conscience fund was in fact created. Now, I did not call the IRS to verify that this exists because I don't want to get audited. I figured it's better just to kind of leave them alone. Like I leave them alone, they leave me alone, and we're all good. We just kind of communicate via letter once a year. And that's, that's it, that's all I want. But I did check this out uh, online and, and it is true that this fund exists. Supposedly, this letter was written to the IRS many years ago. Dear sir, my conscience bothered me. Here is $175, which I owe in back taxes. The letter went on to say, P.S., if my conscience still doesn't bother me, I'll send the rest. (laughs) This is why we need to keep our heart. Because we can deceive ourselves. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Again, we need to keep our heart. But listen, we need to understand that Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 is not referring to our heart being deceitfully wicked because our feelings are deceitful. Though it's true that our feelings can be deceitful, meaning we can feel guilty or we can feel less guilty like that man who sent that letter to the IRS. And we can even feel okay about doing something that's wrong. Or we cannot feel bad even though we've done a lot of things that are wrong. Our feelings can be deceptive. I think we all know that. And though we live in a culture that will say things like, follow your heart, what they're saying is, follow your feelings. But your feelings can, can be tossed to and fro. They can change like that. And it's a very dangerous thing to, to follow our heart or to follow our feelings. Jeremiah 17, 9 isn't saying that our heart is deceitfully wicked because our heart is filled with feelings. Because remember, in Jewish culture, the heart was not the seat of the emotions. The intestines were the seat of the emotions. So you say, what? That sounds kind of weird, right? Because if your heart breaks, your feelings got hurt. For us in the West, our heart is the seat of emotions. But for the Jew, the heart was the seat of thinking, It was the place that they they attributed thought to. So your intelligence was here, not here. The mind was about the will. In other words, the mind is what you did with what was in the heart. Now, marry that with what we talked about last week, how we mentioned the great Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. That's what it says in Hebrew. Remember that story. Why does it say that the word shall be on our heart and not in our heart? And the reason why, according to the rabbinical story, is that if we put the word of God on our heart, when our heart breaks, the word will fall in. And now we own the truth that we previously only knew. Well, it changes our thinking is the idea. It transforms our mind. It causes us to be washed. It causes us to be changed. And so we need God's word to be on our heart so that when the time is appropriate, it can sink in and it can find a home like a seed in soil that's been prepared through suffering and hardship. That's the context of James chapter 5, verse 12. This comes on the heels of suffering. It comes on the heels of a discussion about pain. And so the heart is deceitful above all things, but it's important that we understand what's being referred to here is our way of thinking 
left to ourself without the word of God is deceitful. Meaning our mind processes information that comes from the outside, from the world. It comes from other people, from their opinions, or from our own thoughts, our own opinions. And these things can be incredibly deceitful. This is why we need to have our minds transformed. This is why the scripture says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In other words, so that you will understand how to think, because your thinking will affect what you do. And so the heart is deceitful, because our thinking is deceitful. And so keep your heart. Well, how do we keep our heart? Well, glad you asked. Turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 helps us to understand how we keep our heart. Jesus here speaking again, says in Matthew 12, verse 34, for out of an abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what you put in will change your thinking and the way you think will affect how you speak. And so Matthew 12, verse 34, for out of an abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Notice verse 35. It says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And so we need to keep our heart. So how do we do that? The Bible makes it very clear. That if we hide God's word in our heart, It protects us. It affects our thinking. Of course, that will affect how we speak and it'll affect what we do. And so again, that first precious thing worth keeping, keep your word. Secondly, keep your heart. And thirdly, keep your reward. Notice what it says. Do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. And it goes on to say, lest you fall into judgment. And so keep your reward. The judgment that's spoken of here is not the judgment of our souls. James is speaking to believers. We're not gonna lose our salvation because of things we say or don't say. It's speaking about the judgment of our works. Please turn your Bible over to 1 Corinthians chapter three. You see, the Bible speaks about what is called the Bema Seat Judgment. And it's important that we understand how all this works because we're saved by grace through faith. We are being saved by grace through faith. And one day when we die, we will go to heaven and we will be saved by grace through faith. Now, don't miss this because if somebody asks you the question, are you saved? Well, that's an issue of the past. It's also an issue of the present, but it's also an issue of the future. In other words, we have been saved if we're saved, meaning the day you were justified, the day you were made right with God. Some of you know that day. Some of you know that day and that hour. I don't know the day or the hour. I know the season. I know it was in springtime of 1991. And I was saved by grace through faith. Now, I don't know the exact day, and maybe you don't know the exact day, but what you need to know is that it happened. That's what matters that you know it happened. And if it happened, you were saved by grace through faith. So God's work, grace, and you believed upon him. That's it. But what do you do after you believe? A lot of times Christians will say, well, go to church, read your Bible, do all these different things, because that's what you should do because you are a believer. Nope. You were saved by grace through faith, meaning you were justified. You are being saved by grace through faith. That's called sanctification. So you were justified, you are now being sanctified. And listen, it's important that we know this. This doesn't happen by you simply pulling yourself up and trying really hard to be better. It doesn't happen because you you have a pedigree because you're a pastor's kid or because your parents grew up in the church and they raised you in the church. It doesn't happen because you do all the right things and you look really clean and you don't drink, smoke, or chew or hang out with people who do. 
That doesn't save you, and it doesn't make you any more saved. It doesn't make you any more spiritual. In fact, you are as spiritual as you're going to be when you get saved. So we are saved by grace through faith, meaning justified. It's done. When Jesus says it is finished, he meant it. It's finished. But now we are growing into our salvation. And that's God's work also. So in other words, he began the work in you and he'll be faithful to complete that work. I love the, the story that Billy Graham shared in one of the books he, read, he wrote <clears throat> called Almost Home. And he wrote it about his wife, how his wife was, was traveling home uh, after a speaking engagement. She had been far away in a different city and she got stuck in traffic because their home was out in the mountains and it was only a one lane highway and she was stuck because of road construction. And so she kept seeing all these different signs that were delaying her basically telling her that there's more road construction up ahead. And then when she got to the end, and now all of a sudden it opened back up into the normal highway that it needed to be, and there was no more traffic, there was a sign that just said, end of construction, thank you for your patience. And so she told her family when she got home, I love that truth that our lives sometimes can be filled with frustrations and the whole process of being sanctified, of growing into our salvation. It takes time, meaning this, when we first got saved, you know, it didn't mean that our problems all go away, right? Do you guys know that? When you get saved, your problems don't all go away, right? And when you get saved, you don't just stop sinning, but now all of a sudden you have new problems that you didn't have before, right? <laughs> And you also have a better understanding of your sin than you had before. Meaning, for me, I'm sure it's true for you, there are things that, that I was doing before I got saved that I didn't even know were sin. And after I got saved and my eyes were open, then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm more messed up than I thought I was. Okay? And so we're definitely under construction, just like what she was saying. And that whole process of sanctification can be so frustrating for some of us at some time because we feel like, gosh, I should be further along than this. I should be done by now but I'm not done yet. And of course, God's still at work with me. He's faithful to complete that work. And so she says she was so moved by that whole process, the lesson that the Lord showed her and the sign at the end that said, end of construction, thank you for your patience. She said, one day I would like that to be on my tombstone. And so when she passed away, her family put that on her tombstone. It has her name, Ruth Bell Graham, her birth date, her death date. It has also a, a Chinese character that was really important to her. And below it says, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. Listen, that work, it's a work of God. Meaning this, we couldn't do anything to save ourselves. We needed God all the way through. We needed him to give us this great salvation. We needed him to forgive us of our sins. We needed for him to make us a new creation. Amen? Amen. And he did. By grace through faith, after salvation, the maturity that needs to happen, we can't do it on our own. We can do nothing outside of God. It's his work. We are his workmanship. Meaning he is working on us now. And of course, we are being reconstructed, if you will. And of course, we need people to be patient with us. Amen? Amen. And that means we need to be patient with other people because God's working on them too. And so we were saved, that is justified by grace through faith. We are being saved, that is sanctified by grace through faith. And one day when we die and we go to heaven, we will be saved. That is, we will be glorified by grace through faith. Meaning one day when we get to heaven, everything is made new. But God is the one who does it. Behold, I make all things new. Right for these words are true and faithful. Meaning you can count on it. God's gonna make everything right. He's gonna set things right once and for all. Amen to that? And he's going to completely change you and me. So no more tears, no more sorrow, for the former things have passed away. Can't wait for that. That will happen by grace through faith. And so this salvation that we have 
It's all about grace through faith, meaning God's work, grace, we sometimes like to define that as receiving what we don't deserve, or some use it as an acronym, grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. But it's God's work. Everything God has done, that's grace, we believe upon him. Everything necessary for salvation, Jesus Christ did. We put our trust in him and him alone. And now, of course, we are justified, we are being sanctified, and one day we will be glorified. Scripture puts it this way. He who did not spare his son, how will he not also through him freely give us all things? In other words, he saved us. That was amazing. He justified us. He made us right with God. He's going to finish the job. Amen? Amen. Now, we get that. We understand that. But here's the thing we need to remember. There's more. Because there's always more with God. We don't work. We don't do what we do. We don't do the right thing or say the right thing. We don't do the things that we're supposed to do as Christians to get the approval of God. That's religion. We do the right thing. We keep the commandments. We do all the things that are pleasing to God because we have his approval. Meaning he's captured our heart. He's captured us by his love. And now we respond, we respond to that love with love for him. What it means for us is this, our works matter. We're not saved by our works, but our works do in fact matter. We don't do what we do altruistically. We don't do what we do not expecting anything in return. We do what we do for a reason because he offers us rewards. Now, how many of you knew that God offered us rewards? How many of you know about the Bema Seat Judgment? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Bema Seat Judgment. Okay, good. The Bema Seat Judgment. What is that? Notice what the scripture says here in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, because the Bible tells us that every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that is, the Bema seat judgment. And I believe that's what James is referring to here in verse 12. Lest you fall into judgment, meaning lest you lose in that judgment. Notice what it says here in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. It says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What that's speaking of is salvation. Don't forget this. Salvation is not a thing. Salvation is a person. Jesus is salvation. This is why Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees and to the scribes, says you search the scripture for in them you think you have eternal life, but it is they that speak of me. He is our salvation. He's our source. He's our goal. In other words, he's our foundation. But he's also the capstone. He's the conclusion of everything. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. So no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. So what's it saying? Well, our foundation is our salvation, and that's Jesus. He's the only one who could save us. And so we're saved by him. This is why the scripture says there's only one name under heaven by which men must be saved. That's Jesus' name. So we believe upon him, will not be put to shame. But it goes on and it says, now if anyone builds on this foundation, meaning what do you do after you're saved? If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, or precious stones, that's three different types here. Those are the types of things you want to build with. Or wood, hay, or straw. These things are consumable by fire. It goes on to say, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Hmm. Meaning this, our works will be judged. Now, praise God, we're saved by grace through faith. We are being saved by grace through faith and one day we'll be saved by grace through faith. Our salvation is absolutely secure. 
But what type of rewards will we have? Well, that will be based on the Bema Seed judgment and what type of materials we used in the works that we did. And some people, of course, already have their reward, which is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, when you pray, go to your secret place. So go to your prayer closet, go to that private place where nobody else sees, go to that secret place and pray, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But, those that do what they do to be seen by men, they have their reward. It's talking about the Bema seat, meaning I don't know why this has happened. I'm not trying to step on toes, but just trying to speak what God's word says because this applies to our lives practically. Those that go on social media and take a picture of your Bible and put a cup of coffee right next to it, and there's a beautiful scene in the background. We live in a beautiful area here in Utah. There's a window right there. Your Bible's there. There's a little prayer candle. There's your coffee. There's a nice, beautiful scene past the window with deer prancing. Right? <laughs> and this beautiful little environment for your quiet time as you post you know, at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it says, this is happening. Okay? Hey, congratulations, when you get your likes, you have your reward. Don't miss this. God's word literally speaks against that. When you pray, go to your prayer place, your secret place, not your social media place. Go to that secret place. The Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When you fast, he goes on, don't, don't be gaunt. Don't be, oh, I'm fasting. Right. I hate 4,000 calories in Thanksgiving. And so now I'm making up for it. Yeah, so I'm fasting. So somebody asks you to go out to, to lunch after service, you know, you could simply say, no, thank you. Or I'm busy. Or you could say, well, I'd love to, but I'm fasting. You have to give the, the long pause and look off in the middle distance. I'm fasting. Because it just makes you look and sound more spiritual. You have your reward. If they think that's spiritual, you have your If they think you're weird, you, did you just think they're weird? Man, don't do it. Listen, our motives, our intentions, our goals, our heart, it's what's being judged there at the Bema Seat Judgment. Listen, our maturity our capacity for blessing is what's being judged at the Bema Seat Judgment. Notice what it says. It says, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. Interesting. So how does this exactly work? Well, we have to understand what the Bema seat is to be able to understand how it works. You see, the Bema seat, when you hear about it, you might be thinking of a seat, a throne, a chair. That's not what it means. Seat is a place. It's the seat of judgment or the place of judgment. So if you go to Israel with us, the first site we go to is Caesarea Maritamia, that is Caesarea by the sea. And there is a theater there that faces towards the Mediterranean Sea. There is a stage that is surrounded on three sides by the theater. That stage is called the Bema. So the Bema in Greek is speaking of a stage and the idea is attached to what we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, which would really be describing not a theater, but a Colosseum. And that Colosseum would have a stage in the middle. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with endurance set before us, 
laying aside the sin and the weight which so easily ensnares us. In other words, lay aside the sin, the thing that grieves God, whatever we do that misses the mark, whatever we do that fails to to reach God's glory, whatever we do that is a mistake, a failure, whatever we do that grieves God is a sin and the weight that is whatever is unnecessary. Lay aside the sin and the weight which so easily ensnares us, running our race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So if that's the case, then we run our race now and then we die. And after we die, we live again because we have been saved by grace through faith. We are being saved by grace through faith. And one day we will be saved by grace through faith when we die and we get to heaven. And then the Bema Seat judgment. Again, our souls aren't being judged, but our works are. And what that means is then your name would be called out. Your name would be called out in that big arena and all your works would be put, as it were, on that stage, on that bema. And the best way I could describe it in my mind is that everything you've ever done, whatever it is, it's right there on that stage. The things you didn't watch, the things you didn't say, the things you didn't do that were wrong, the things you did do that were good, all the people you talked about about Jesus to, all the times you read God's word and prayed, the way you cared for people, how patient you were with other people on the 15 freeway, all of that goes on that stage, okay? Now, what materials were used? What were your motives? You probably don't even know fully, but it'll be tested by fire. And if it was of gold, silver, and precious stones, then when the fire comes, your reward remains. But if it was wood, hay, or stubble, the fire comes and judges it, it burns away. And what that means is, though we all might have a lot of things on that stage, when the fire comes and judges our works, some here would walk away with a ton of rewards. So many rewards that that King Jesus, the one who is doing the judging, is excited for you. Your name's called, you go down, all your work's on the stage, the fire comes and pretty much everything is still there. All right. You know, he's Jesus. He's excited for you. He's happy for you because you have lots of rewards and then you get your heavenly suburban, right, that has a big giant trailer and all the stuff's loaded up by angels and you drive off to your mansion in heaven. Praise God. Amen. Sounds good? Okay. Or you did a lot of building with wood, hay, or stubble, and the fire comes, and pretty much everything's gone, and you get a gift bag. That's it. You get a gift bag with a little, little tissue. That's all you get. But you got it from Jesus, which means if you got it from Jesus, it's still going to bless you. And listen, The scripture says he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Hmm. So how does that work? In other words, the person who gets the gift bag suffered loss, but maybe in some way doesn't fully understand what he lost because it is heaven. In other words, the one that gets the massive reward, they're happy. And the one that gets the gift bag, they're happy. It's heaven. Somehow, they're saved. Yes, they're not losing their salvation, but they did lose out on something. But what does that mean or what does that look like? Listen, this is speaking of capacity. And this is why it's so important that we do what Jesus said, that we store our treasures in heaven, not here on earth. That we understand what's valuable, what's important, so that we keep those things that are precious. Keep your word, keep your heart, because it's gonna lead to you keeping your reward so that you don't lose by fire the things you worked for. Well, how practically does that work? Well, let me 
put it like this. When I was a kid, kindergarten age, I had all sorts of different toys. And one of the things that I had were these little plastic green army men. I mean, you guys know what those were, the little green army men that were plastic with a little base. Who remembers those? Remember those? Yep. And so we all had them. And so mine didn't always have the base. I would cut the little base off because I wanted them to be able to move more realistically. And also the base got in the way of all sorts of fun stuff, like putting them inside of little cars that I blew up with firecrackers. And I burned them, I shot them, I drowned them, I buried them. I did all sorts of different things to them because they were little green army men. They had to kind of pay their dues. I played with them when I was in kindergarten. I'm, I'm sure I played with them when I was in first grade. I probably played with them when I was in second grade, but here's something that's interesting that happened. As my life went on at some point in time, I didn't play with them. I don't know when I stopped playing with them, but I do remember when Vicki and I started dating that there was never a time that she said, well, hey, what are we doing? I thought, I thought we'd do something different tonight. I pulled out a little tub of Green Army Men and said, hey, do you want to play? (laughs) That never happened, right? Because she would have broken up with me. (laughs) Well, and there's another thing too. I just wasn't interested in doing that anymore. Think about this. If you were interested in doing that at some point in time, you eventually grew out of it. And of course, we grew out of a lot of different things because our capacity, listen, our capacity for enjoyment has changed. So we're no longer blessed, we're no longer encouraged, we're no longer made happy by the things that used to make us happy. We're no longer entertained by the thing that used to entertain us because our capacity has changed. Hmm. Well, think about that. You see, I don't remember when I stopped playing with those little green army men. I don't remember where they are. I don't remember what happened to them. I just stopped caring. I outgrew them. And I think there are a lot of things that Christians need to outgrow. I think there are a lot of things that Christians think are important right now that they need to understand is not important. This is why the scripture says in Hebrews 12 verse 1, Therefore, since you are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with endurance set before us, laying aside the sin and the weight. That is the unnecessary, unimportant things which so easily ensnare us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We need to outgrow things. We need to have a greater capacity. You see, in heaven, I think there will be people who are enjoying what heaven is. I don't know what it's going to be like. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I could think of a lot of different fun things that we can do here on earth. That means heaven's got to be better. When I went skydiving, we were in Moab, And it was a blast. The falling part was the blast. The part under the the canopy, not so much fun. Just kind of boring. But the falling part, that was fun. It was falling with style. It was amazing. And when it was done, the guy I went with, he looked at me and he goes, what's next? And I thought, I love that question, what's next? Then he went on to say what he thought was next. There are people who get ropes and they attach them to these arches out here in Utah and they jump and they swing and thought, this sounds like fun. That sounds like something that'd be worth doing next. There's all sorts of things in this life we can do to have fun. If that's not your thing, something else is your thing. And there's so many different things that we can do that are amazing things. And listen, none of them compare to heaven. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him which means heaven is filled with these amazing, these incredible things. Or you could be playing with green army men. What type of capacity will you have when you get there? 
That's what the Bama Seed Judgment is all about. And that's why it's so critical for us to treasure these things, to keep your word, to keep your heart, and of course, to keep your reward. Because there are certain things in this life that are worth treasuring. This is my wedding ring. My wedding ring is a replacement ring because the first wedding ring that I had, I lost on a soccer field in Orem. Somebody just got ratted out for losing their ring too. How many of you lost your ring, by the way? Raise your hand if you lost your ring. It's so sad. So sad. <laughs> I was bummed. I was heartbroken when I lost, when I lost my ring. And um, when I was in Israel a, a couple of years later, I had a chance to rectify that problem because um, we were seeing a, a jeweler there in Jerusalem. And I also had a chance to rectify another problem because when I got my wife her ring, when I asked her to marry me, um, I was nervous. And it was the first time I was ever nervous around her. We had had a wonderful night planned out and I had a wonderful thing to, to share. I don't remember what it was now, but the words didn't come out though I had it planned. And instead, as I was getting ready to say it, I was like, nothing came out. And so I was so nervous that I had the ring in the box and I slid it across the table and I, I literally slid it at her. <laughs> and I said, this is for you. <laughs> Hands down, the worst proposal in the history of the world. I, I don't think that anybody could have done worse than that. And so when I said it, when I slid it, and I said, this is for you, she goes, no, no, like, no it's not this way. This is, and I, I tried to redeem it, and it, it just went downhill from there. And so she just went with yes. And so we ended up getting married. Our, our, our wedding ceremony was wonderful. We were excited, a brand new couple. You know, a year later, two years later, five years later, you know, this didn't come up, but eventually it came up again, you know, that my proposal wasn't, really good. And so when I lost my ring, I had a chance when I was in Israel to rectify two problems, to replace my ring um, with this ring, but also to have a second chance to share with my wife because I bought her a ring just like this one. And so um, on it, etched in Hebrew are the words, um, for I know the thoughts I think towards you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We had to put down, we need to put up. Right? And so I came home and, uh, from that trip and went into our bedroom and, and, and we sat in the bed and, and we just talked and I, I put her ring on her finger and, and I, I just said what it said here. I said, I, I know the thoughts I think towards you. And then I shared my thoughts, which you can't hear because they're private. They're just between her and I. You shouldn't want to know, that's weird. So, so I just said, you know, I know the thoughts I think toward you. And I, and I shared, you know, my heart and she said, you know, you did well. And after that, we decided as a couple that we wanted to make these rings for our kids. So when our kids reached a certain age, every one of them received one of these rings. Now, it was popular for, for a lot of Christians to, to give purity rings to their kids back in the 80s and early 90s. Um, I like the idea, but I, I don't think it's a good idea to give those rings because it's making an oath. It's making a commitment that they may or may not be able to, to keep. And, and what happens if they fail? What, what defines that, that, that purity? It's gonna change from person to person. And so we didn't want to do that. Instead, we did want to give them something that, that meant something really important, the same truth that we receive from God on our wedding day. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so when they reach a certain age, each one of them would get a date with us, and, and each one of them received their ring. Rachel got her ring. Sarah got her ring. Abby got her ring. Caleb got his ring, and on Thanksgiving, just a few days ago, which was Lily's birthday, she got her ring. I know the thoughts I think towards you, is what it says, meaning this. There's nothing that you could do that's ever going to change the way I love you. There's nothing that you could do 
that would change the hope I have for who you are. There's nothing you can do that would make my heart not be for you in every way. Listen, it's a keepsake that's precious to us as parents. This ring is more than a ring. It's something worth protecting. It's something worth keeping because we have a God in heaven who's done the same thing for you and me. We shared it last week. I'll finish with this today. Number six, verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. Don't miss this. The Lord bless you and keep you. Same word. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Would you stand with me?